Hi, I'm Gina with Generation Schools Network, and I have with us today Natasha Collins, forensic chemist with the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. Natasha will present to you all today into your classrooms, and we will be recording so that students will be able to view this at a later date as well. Natasha, we're so thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you. And you can get started when you're ready. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Natasha Collins. I have been a forensic chemist for a little over 16 years now. I've actually been with the CBI since August of 09. And prior to moving to Colorado, I was with the Hamilton County Crime Lab in Cincinnati, Ohio, doing the exact same thing. So a little bit about what I do on a daily basis. So items of evidence come into our crime lab and I analyze them for the presence of a controlled substance. So I have a little presentation. There's not a lot in it. Um, I kind of wanted to keep it short and sweet because I remember being in high school. <laughs> And obviously I don't like to sit through a bunch of presentations, but I'm gonna share my screen just so you guys can kind of see um, what a day in the life of kind of what I go through and how our lab works. And then I'll kind of go into like my background, my education, and then I'll open it up for you guys to go into any questions. And if you do have any questions and you're afraid you're not gonna remember, either write them down or you can toss them in the chat and I will make sure that I am looking for them. So I'm gonna share my screen. All right, so this is kind of just obviously what a forensic laboratory and kind of what we do, what the definition of forensic science is. Obviously there's more than just chemistry that just happens to be what my discipline is. We have a bunch of different disciplines in all of our labs. There are four labs throughout the state that are part of CBI. CBI in progress. Um, so obviously this, um, into the different disciplines. So we have a lab in Arvada, we have a lab in Pueblo, we have a lab in Grand Junction, and then we have the lab that I'm currently out of and that is up in Greeley, which is called the Northern Colorado Regional Forensic Lab. So these are the different disciplines that between those four facilities we can provide services to. So you've got latent prints, footwear, tire, firearms, physical match, audio, video, drug chemistry, hairs and fibers, biological sciences, which is your DNA, trace chemistry, arson, gunshot residue, computer forensics, and crime scenes. Here's some different careers. So a lot of people think forensics is only just you work in a lab, and that's not really the case. There's actually other types of forensics, especially nowadays with the amount of computers and the amount of stuff that is online. So if numbers are your thing, you can actually be a forensic accountant. If psychology is your thing, you can be a profile, be a forensic patho uh, psychologist. Forensic pathologist is still a doctor, but it's somebody that does the autopsies. Those are important for crime scenes. Those are important for any type of crime. Um, there's obviously fish and wildlife. Um, I know that sounds kind of weird, but if you like being out in nature, there's still some forensics that are possibly out there. Entomologists are all about bugs. Botanists are all about the plants. Um, obviously the chemists, molecular biologists, they kind of, a lot of those usually end up being the DNA. Anthropology is all about the bones. Um, so if you're kind of interested in the bone part of it, that's usually a forensic anthropologist. So if a bone is found or a set of bones is found, usually they'll call out a forensic anthropologist to kind of give them an idea on how old that person is, what sex that person is, and how possibly if there was any type of foul play. Room testimony. This is a big one. So for anybody in a crime lab, you have to be comfortable talking in front of people. Part of my job is that I have to go and I have to testify to the results that I issue from a case. So I will get up in front of the judge, I have to swear in, and then I have to testify to my results and the testing that I did in the lab. So keep that in mind if this is a career that you're kind of looking into or that is interesting you, you do need to make sure that you're comfortable speaking in front of people because that is going to be part of your job. So I might get into a little bit more about chemistry since obviously that's what my specialty is. So types of chemistry cases, plant material, we still get plant material even though in the state of Colorado, marijuana is legal if you're over 21. Uh, powders are a lot, tablets, we get a lot, liquids, 
eh, kind of depends on the case. Uh, clandestine labs, we don't see as much anymore as we used to. Miscellaneous is more of like our candies, our edibles. Sometimes people will put drugs on different types of substance. So sometimes we get Sour Patch Kids, sometimes we get sugar cubes, uh, sometimes it's just paper. So we might get those type of substances. So that's what we kind of call the miscellaneous section. Tampering, so this is more of if someone has possibly taken the original drug and they have removed it from what it should have been in and replaced it with, let's say, just some saline. Then we might be asked to one, test that to see if there actually is any drug in it, but then we also might be asked to compare it to what they know has not been tampered that's still sealed. So then we can compare those two and we'll look to see if that case has been tampered with. Um, we do provide toxicology, but toxicology and chemistry are two very separate disciplines. So toxicology is looking at your urine, your blood. Um, if it's a deceased person that has been deceased for a while, usually you have no more, or at least not very good fluids left in your body. So they might look at the vitreous fluid, which is the fluid in your eyes, or they will actually uh, look at your organs. Um, so your organs can be um, ground up, which I know sounds really gross, but they will be ground up actually in a blender. And we can use that liquid then to test to find out if you have any type of compounds in your system. So we provide very, we both look for drugs or different types of analysis, but our samples are very different. So my samples are actually drugs usually, whereas their samples are more bodily fluids, or like I said, sometimes it could be an organ that has been change to a fluid. For us, the analytical process kind of goes in this type of scenario. So we'll do a visual exam. Um, for us, especially in, in court, we get asked a lot about chain of custody, meaning that where that item of evidence came from, who has touched it, who has sealed it, um, and where it has been prior to it getting to court. So obviously I can only testify to when it comes into our system. And then once it leaves, I have no idea what happened to it and I can't testify to anything prior to it. So I can just testify to when it was in our system. But chain of custody usually plays a big deal because sometimes people say, well, it's not mine. So I'm also looking to make sure that it's sealed. I wanna make sure there hasn't been any contamination since it entered into our system. So I will make sure that it actually is sealed appropriately appropriately. If it is not, I have to document that. Then the next thing we do is I do a weight. So per our state statutes, because you do have to kind of learn some of those, um, we do have weight thresholds for different types of drugs. So if I can, I'm going to take what's called a net weight. So I want to have that net weight and I'm going to weigh whatever that substance is. And then I'm going to take my samples and then I'll analyze it. So some of the samples, as you can see, I can do a color test. So that's exactly, sometimes you see it on TV, like uh, CSI. I'm looking for a color change. So certain drugs will produce a certain color change with a certain reagent. So that's what I'm looking for. And then our instrumentation, which is usually our confirmation test, is the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, or GCMS, and then the FTIR. The SEM and the micro... Um, spectrometer and the pyrolysis. We use a lot of those more for trace analysis. We can use them for chemistry if we have a really, really weird, not normal case, which doesn't happen very often, but sometimes it does. So we do have those instruments available, but they are mainly used in our trace section for gunshot residue and um, like paint and physical match. So this is just a couple pictures of what some of our color tests look like. So the middle one is actually, you've got what's called, the purple is the marquee, which usually is um, opioids. So heroin will turn that really pretty purple, oxycodone, also buprenorphine will turn that really pretty purple. The test next to that is cobalt thiocyanate. And that is actually, um, you usually see that color change with cocaine. And then the very bottom, is a three-step process for marijuana. So we have different steps and then you'll get that separate layer of purple if it's positive for a cannabinoid.
Here is some of our instrumentation that we use. So obviously we use a stereoscope that we're looking at. Um, obviously this is marijuana under the scope. That's not the only thing we look at under the scope. Sometimes if a tablet comes in and the tablet is pretty worn and I can't see the markings, I will throw it under the scope and kind of change the lighting so that I can see if I can see the markings. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but I always try just in case so that I can have a reference. And then obviously, like I stated before, our two big instruments that we use in chemistry are the GCMS and the FTIR. This is what our data looks like. <laughs> I know it kind of looks a little look like gibberish, but after a long time, you learn to kind of understand what it means. So on the top screen, the GCMS is actually two separate instruments that are combined into one. So on the top, the GC with the peaks on it, that is actually one instrument. So that will take a sample and it separates it out. The bottom part of that is the mass spec. So once it's separated and it's went through, it starts going through the mass spec and it fragments. So pretty much it breaks apart into all these little ticks that are below that. So that's what we're looking at. And then we compare those to a standard. So this on the bottom is actually what cocaine looks like from the top picture. So that top one with the three, the six peaks is actually what we call our drug mix. So we make that in-house to make sure our instrument's working. And then below that is actually what cocaine looks like on our mass spec. And then down below is what an FTIR looks like. So the FTIR is a little bit more complicated system in the sense of you have to have more of a pure sample. So we can't have a mixture because otherwise it's going to produce a sample that is a mixture because it can't separate out those mixtures. So this is what we're looking at. So on the very top where it's the red, that's the sample from our case. And then obviously the blue is what is from our known. So that's from the standard that we have in-house. So it's a little bit different looking data. So for Colorado, we have to also know the schedules. So different drugs have different potential for abuse and that way that therefore they are scheduled differently. So schedule one means that there is very high for abuse and there is no known medical usage, at least not according to the lawmakers. Then it goes all the way down to a schedule five, and that means that it doesn't have as high of abuse, but it is very useful in the medical field. There are some drugs in Colorado that are what we call controlled, but they are not listed in the scheduling. So that means that like, they'll control them and say how much you can have of them, but they're not listed in the one through five. Makes it a little confusing in our job, but there are some that are like that. These are just some examples. Cocaine is a schedule two. MDMA, which is sometimes referred to as ecstasy, is a schedule one. Hydrocodone, state of Colorado can be either a two or a three, depending on how it com comes in. So if it's a tablet and it has acetaminophen in it, it's a schedule three. If someone has crushed that tablet and it is no more a pharmaceutical preparation, then it is now a schedule two. Um, and then diazepam is a schedule four. So when I said that we sometimes get some weird cases, here's are some of our pictures of some of the cases we have gotten in. So um, the very top one is actually a mushroom grow. So psilocybin mushrooms have to have a pretty moist environment. And so what they had done is they started their own grow in their, their refrigerator. Um, and so that's what we got in. We were not able to actually identify the mushrooms. It hadn't grown enough yet in that one, but that is something that we sometimes see. And a lot of times we can't actually get the mushroom or the psilocin psilocybin and identify it. And we can get it and call it. The next picture is actually some THC drinks that came in. Uh, this was kind of interesting because obviously we had never seen a drink with THC in it. So this was kind of weird. Um, and we had to do some extractions to try to get the sugars out of it so that we didn't obviously see a bunch of the sugars on our instrument. Then the next one is some caramels. We do get a lot of edibles. Um, sometimes we get edibles from like a dispensary that are obviously we know have THC in them. Sometimes though we get homemade edibles that somebody has decided to make themselves. So we do have to test those and see if we can find an unknown or a controlled substance in those. Um, you also have the soup. We had somebody say that they were poisoned. So we tested the soup. And then down here, these little owls, 
they were actually stuffed full of, if you look at the picture next to it, of this crystalline material. So this was actually found through the Postal Service. It was um, intercepted and we had to cut open these owls, these metal little statutes to find these containers. This does happen actually more frequently than we would think. Um, we do get a lot of stuff that is intercepted from the Postal Service. Sometimes it will go to the federal agency, which is the DEA, but a lot of times it will come to us as the state agency because we are the state lab. So those are some of the weird cases that we have had in the past that are kind of just stuck out. So that was the end. Like I said, I was trying to kind of keep it short and sweet. Um, so just a little bit about me and my background. So I currently hold a Bachelor of Science in Forensic Science Chemistry. If you are looking to go into this field from a lab standpoint, I would definitely suggest something in a hard science. A lot of labs for accreditation purposes are not really allowing a criminal justice degree anymore. I'm not saying it's not possible, I'm not saying that it's not gonna happen, but a lot of labs are kind of sticking away from that. And mainly because some of the disciplines have to have that hard science. Biology is one of them. So if you have any desire to do DNA, there's actually specific coursework that you are required to have before you can actually do DNA analysis. And that's actually not by us, that is actually by the feds because we have to go through certain accreditation processes. And in order to use CODIS, which is a system for DNA, they require you to have certain coursework. So it makes it a little bit easier to just go into a hard science if this is anything that is any even remotely interesting to you. Also, you might have a degree in chemistry, but we also have those people that work in firearms or they work in latent prints or they do decide, you know what, I think I wanna do biology. So it's just because you have a degree in chemistry doesn't mean that that's gonna pigeonhole you to have to do chemistry. If biology is something interesting, I would check with your labs. Um, I know there's a couple classes that are specific for bio. So genetics is one, biochemistry is another. So you have to have those courseworks in your undergraduate in order to do that. If you're just looking at kind of like a crime scene technician, maybe through a police department or a sheriff's department, a lot of times they do not require you to have a higher education. So you don't have to go to college. Usually you do have to go through, graduate from high school. So you do have to have a high school diploma or a GED. But again, a lot of those police departments are also making you go through some form of training to have that extra degree or extra certification just to do crime scene technician as well. There is a lot of crime scene stuff out there that you can find online if that is something that's interesting to you. I actually did that for about six years. Um, when I first moved here to Colorado, I did our crime scene unit. I don't do it anymore because I have little kids, um, but I did do it for a long time. The one thing to remember about crime scenes is crime does not have a time. <laughs> so. When you're on call, you can get called out at five o'clock in the morning or you can get called out at midnight and then you're there all day. So just kind of keep that in mind that when you're on call, it's all the time for that week, 24 um, seven. So that's a little bit about like my background and how I got my degree. Um, I have been doing chemistry and like I had stated since about 16 years, I started in 07. So this is my 16th year going into this. I really like it. Um, I enjoy my job. For me, this is all about a piece of the puzzle. So a typical day for me is I come in, I grab my cases, I start analyzing them, I open them up, I put them on the instrument, and then I wait for my data to come off. So depending on what instrument I used, I might be done in an hour, but if I use the GCMS, it might be about two hours, depending on how long it takes and how many samples I have for that case. Some cases can be one item, but some cases can be all the way up to 50 or 100. It just kind of depends on the case and what's being asked. For the state of Colorado, we do not have what we call um, quantitation necessarily. So I don't need to know how much of, let's say, cocaine is in that sample. 
I just need to know whether or not I found cocaine. So that does make it a little bit easier on us in the lab because that's not as much work. Um, we don't have to then go through the process of trying to identify stuff that is not controlled. So I don't need to know what else is in there, if there's acetaminophen, if there's levamisole, which are all types of what we call fillers. I don't need to know that. I just need to identify the controlled substance and that's all I'm gonna report out. There are times that I don't find a controlled substance and I just report out that it's no controlled substance. If I'm asked to identify a non-controlled substance, it's usually because there's a reason. So it could be that there's a juvenile involved or that it's coming out of our prisons. If it's coming from the prison, any type of substance is considered a contraband. They're not allowed to have any of it. So there's times that sometimes I get asked to identify alcohol that they've decided to make in their jail cell or I get asked to identify cigarettes, which is nicotine. So even though that's not a controlled substance, they're not allowed to have that in the prison. So therefore I'm asked to identify it. Other than that, um, it kind of depends on the day. If I have court, I had court last week. So sometimes I might come into work, I might get ready, print off my case, and then I head out to court. Since we are a state agency, I am required to travel across the state. So we try to keep it pretty separated to where like we do the northern part of the state, Pueblo does the lower part of the state, Grand Junction does the western part of the slate. So we're not traveling as much and spending as much time in the car, but that doesn't always happen. Sometimes there's rushes and if somebody's not available to do a case, it might get shipped to one of the other labs and then that case might go to trial. So you might be traveling to get somewhere just so you can go to court. So even though I do the Northern part of the state, some of those areas are four hours away from me. So I might literally be all day or I might have to go up the night before, spend the night then testify in that morning and come home. The other thing to take into account is as a state agency, sometimes we get stuff that's going to go either statewide. So that's a little different that actually the courthouse is down in Jeff Jefferson County, which is down near Golden, or I have had to testify federally. So I got flown up to South Dakota for a case that our state troopers actually processed. So it was a bunch of weed, marijuana, that was coming across state lines. They were trying to get it into Nebraska. They got stopped before they got into Nebraska, and the federal agency so decided to prosecute it. So since I did the analysis here in the state of Colorado, I had to be flown up to South Dakota to testify in the federal court system. And then once I was done, I was flown back down to go back to work. So again, kind of just depends, especially as a state agency, where I'm gonna go and what my job might entail for that day, because it could always be different. Also, there's times that I don't actually get to do a case for a whole week. So just because it kind of depends, I might be in class or I might be teaching or I might be in court. Sometimes we go to court and there's been times I have sat there all day and I don't get on the stand. So then I have to go back the next day and hope and pray that I actually get on the stand so that I can go back to the lab. We do try to go to at least one training a year, um, trying to keep up to date on any of the new drugs or instruments. So drugs usually follow a trend. So we might start seeing stuff in Europe or even in Australia. And then they start hitting our coasts. So California and the East Coast will start seeing some drugs before we ever see them in the middle of the states. So sometimes California will send out an email because there's actually an email chain and a group that is international for chemists. And they will say, hey, do you guys know what this is? And some even in Canada or somewhere in Australia will be like, yeah, we just had this in a case. So then we kind of know to be on the lookout. And when we get it, because eventually we usually do, we then kind of can go back to those emails and look at them and be like, oh, okay. So it makes it very nice when we do those trainings because we've now created a network and we can contact these people with unknowns that we might not have seen in our system and we don't know how to identify, but they have seen. So they give us that ability to contact them and be able to be up to date to know, hey, this is coming. That's kind of what happened with fentanyl. I know fentanyl is a big, big topic across the state of Colorado. Um, I'm sure as you kids, um, I'm not dumb. So I know kids have heard about all kinds of stuff. 
Um, but that's how we actually heard the fentanyl stuff was really starting to kick up. We did not see it as much as some of the other states. Obviously now that's our number two submission. Um, methamphetamine is the number one for us. That's what we see the most. And that is what we identify the most as meth. But fentanyl has now surpassed every other drug and is now our number two. And then number three, a little bit way further down on the list is heroin. So the top three drugs that we see are meth, fentanyl, and heroin for here in the state of Colorado. Other states obviously are a little differently. For us, that just happens to be how it has went, especially the last three years. Um, that fentanyl change really started around 2020. Um, there are some analysts that have actually never seen a fentanyl that is not illicit, meaning that usually the types of fentanyl that we get in are illicit tablets, meaning pills. So some of our analysts have only been on the bench for four or five years. They've never seen those same pills with what they were supposed to have, which was oxycodone, which is another schedule two. So that's kind of interesting, at least from my standpoint, because I've been doing this for so long, is some of those analysts have actually never seen what those pills are supposed to look like. So it's kind of nice to have that as a background because we obviously have seen that in my, before all of this started and they have not. So it's kind of interesting to watch the different trends that happens over the course of my career because marijuana used to be really big. And now, obviously now that it's legal, we don't get that many. If we get marijuana, we get massive amounts of marijuana. So we're talking- This is Natasha Collin. Sorry. Um, we see like trash cans full of them or duffel bags full. Um, so yeah, it can be pretty interesting at work because <laughs> sometimes we're like, what are we supposed to do with this? How do we weigh this? So we sometimes have to be creative to figure out how we're going to weigh a trash can full of marijuana because we don't have a scale or a bucket big enough to dump that in it. So, and the same thing happens with some of the other stuff. Um, a lot of times our big busts that we get are from canine alerts. So we do, obviously a lot of agencies have canines and so they are for narcotics. So we might get those busts from a hidden compartment in a car. The majority of the time, those hidden compartments don't hold just a little teeny tiny amount. They hold massive amounts. So a lot of the stuff that you see on the news usually does eventually make its way to us. There are other labs though in the state. So CBI is not the only lab in the state. So we've got Denver PD has their own chemistry. Um, Jeff, Jefferson County has their own lab. Down in Douglas, they opened up the Unified um, Metro Forensic Lab, which was a combination of I think Douglas, Aurora. Uh, I wanna say there's one more agency, but they all, have like employees from those different agencies. And so they have their own lab now. And then obviously CBI. And the lab that I work out of, the NCRFL, is actually five different agencies. So CBI is housed out of here and we have employees, but our actually facility is owned by Weld County. So we have Weld County Sheriff's Office, we have Larimer County Sheriff's Office, Fort Collins PD, Greeley PD, and Loveland PD. So all of their employees are housed out of my lab and we all work cases together under CBI's quality system. And that's how we're accredited. So our lab system as a whole, so all four of our labs are accredited and we have to go through that assessment. So I don't have anything else that you guys, unless you guys really have questions for me, see what has been the most amount of method you've had. Um, so the question was, what has been the most amount of methamphetamine that I've had at the lab at once? Um, so here's the thing. Sometimes they would like to submit more than what we accept. So as I stated earlier, Colorado is a weight state, meaning that there is weight thresholds. So actually for methamphetamine, the maximum weight for one individual is only 112 grams. That's not very high. So we had a case that they tried to submit 99 pounds of meth. Um, obviously that is way, way over because one pound is I think 453 grams if I remember correctly. So if I only need 112 grams, one pound is 453 and they had 99 pounds. Obviously I don't need all that. <laughs> 
So we actually only had them submit one pound. Um, they did have a couple different suspects. So I think in the long run, I ended up doing like four of those, but they came in as like what we call bundles. So they were wrapped with a whole bunch of saran wrap and then they had tape and then they try to mask the smell usually from the canines. Doesn't usually work, but they try. Um, and so sometimes we'll get mayonnaise or mustard or dryer sheets, or I've had like oil grease. So sometimes we're cutting through those layers just to get to the inside package of those drugs. So they're usually, like, like I said, they're about a pound a piece is usually what these bundles are that come in from the, for the Met. Not all the time, but sometimes. So that was probably the biggest case. But again, I did not take all 99 pounds of those. Um, let's see. Then I had... Was there ever a case that really disgusted you? Um, so, so sometimes they can get gross. So we sometimes get stuff like I stated from the prison, um, which means that somebody, it could have been either they swallowed it or they swallowed it prior to getting into the jail. So now you have to wait for it to pass through their system. Um, so yes. I have had stuff from pretty much every orifice that you can imagine. Um, it's usually not very fun and can obviously smell and be gross, but it's kind of par for the course. We just make sure we obviously do it under the hood to kind of help with the smell. And then obviously we, we're always changing our gloves with between the cases, but I might put on an extra like mask and I might put on an extra coat, just kind of depends on like how nasty the case is. But yeah, there's been some disgusting ones. Let's see, average income. So this kind of depends. So this is going to vary extremely between state to state because cost of living is so different. So I can tell you for the state of Colorado, just because that's kind of where I've been for the last you know, 13 years, I believe our CBI interns, which is what you usually start at if you're fresh out of college. So if you're fresh out of college, you have no experience in a lab, like working in a lab that does not include an internship because most degree programs do have you do an internship, but that does not include this. This is actually on the bench experience. You've already worked some other lab. So if you are brand new, have never done that, usually they're starting at around between 50 and 60. Obviously that can go all the way up. So at a CRIM 2, which is a criminal investigator 2 for the state of Colorado. And again, this is just CBI. I don't know like the individual DPD, so Denver um, Police Department, I don't know their salary ranges. Um, but for us, we then go up to what we call a criminal 2 and that's still a bench scientist. And that's a senior scientist. So that means you've been on the bench for at least eight years doing casework. That doesn't include your training. I think they start at about 97. So it's a good chunk of a pay range. And then obviously there's, that's just the starting. So then you can move up from there. There also is obviously like management, like management moving up. So if you choose to become like a CRIM 3 or a CRIM 4, Criminal Investigator 3, which is our managers, and then a Criminal Investigator 4 is our directors. So obviously those pay raises go up. I'm just a Criminal Investigator 2 but I am a senior scientist because I have 16 years of experience. Um, how often do you have to deal with murder cases? So I do not that much um, unless something happens like a drug deal gone bad. I actually just testified actually in a homicide case two weeks ago. Um, I don't really deal with a whole lot of murder cases because majority of my stuff, like I stated, are drug items. Um, and usually if it is a homicide case, Drugs are not usually the most important part of that trial or that case. Sometimes if it's a large amount, they might go for that because it might help with the charge or increase the number of charges they can charge that individual with. But I really do not deal with that many murder cases. Obviously, when I was doing crime scenes, I dealt with it quite a lot. Um, but now actually just on the bench, I don't deal with it as much as I used to. What are the hours you work per week when you are not on call? So we are not on call unless we are part of the crime scene unit, which our crime scene unit for CBI is actually under what we call investigations. So CBI as a whole has three tiers. So one is forensic services, which is where I work. One is investigations, which is now where our crime scene unit is. And then one is what we call administration. So that's our um, CICU or CIC, um, CIC, BMU, which is like if you're going to buy a gun, you need a background check. 
If you're a teacher, you have to have your fingerprints done. That's by IDENT. So those kind of discipline or those kind of areas, those are all under our administration um, tier. So crime scenes, I'm not really on call um, unless something big happened. So like when Columbine happened, all of us had to go because it was such a big scene. We all had to go. Um, but that doesn't happen very often. So we don't, we're not all on call. So just the crime scene individuals are who are on call. But in the average week, I work 40 hours. Um, I do work for tens, which is kind of nice. So you can pick either Monday through Thursday or Tuesday through Friday. And then they also offer nine nines. So we can kind of have a flexible work schedule, which is really nice. Do you work on any crime scenes or just in lab? Yeah, so I just answer that. I do not work crime scenes anymore. I just work the lab unless, like I said, something massive happens and it's like an all hands on deck and they call everybody. Like with any other job, I assume there's stress. How much stress comes with this job and how do you deal with stress? So there's actually a lot of stress. <laughs> um, just because a lot of times it comes down to, I mean, I feel like I don't have as much stress as some of the other disciplines because my cases aren't as what I call horrific. I'm not dealing with a um, homicide that might be in, involve a child or a sexual assault on a child or on anyone, really. Um, I don't deal a lot with homicides, but we do see a lot of really not nice things. That's the only downside with working in a crime lab and helping out in this type of discipline. Forensic services obviously deals with crimes, so you know there's something going on. And let's be honest, not all crimes are just an auto theft that somebody stole your car or somebody stole your TV. There are some really nasty and really bad crimes. Um, we do have the ability to um, talk to psychiatrists if we feel like we need to. So if stress starts, that's just part of our that's just part of our policy. We have what we call CSAP. And so they provide that for us. If we feel like it's kind of getting too rough and we just need somebody to talk to, we have that ability. It's free for us as a state employee. So we can always call. Um, I have kids at home. So I kind of try to leave whatever I had at work at the door when I leave. So that way I'm present with my kids. My kids make me smile. Yes, they drive me nuts at the same time. But a lot of times I try to be very present with them. Um, if I am really, really stressed, it's been a really, really bad day. Um, I like to read. So I do not read nonfiction. I deal with enough nonfiction in my life with my job. So murder mystery, I know sounds weird, but I like murder mystery. I also like romance. So <laughs> I kind of like, I just try to kind of escape what might be going on at my job. Um, so that's a lot of times how I kind of deal with stress. So I just... And like I said, if it gets to be too much, which sometimes happened, especially during crime scenes, um, I would talk to somebody and we would have what we call like a debrief is what they called them. And so they would kind of go over the case and kind of discuss with all of us that happened to be at that crime scene just to kind of make sure we were all doing okay. What was the longest case you were on? And let's see, longest case. <sighs> So do you, I'm not sure if this means crime scene or if this means in the lab. So longest case that I've had, it took me two weeks to do. It was back when um, the synthetic spices were coming out and there was all this talk with the bath salts. And so people were like saying they were going to bite your head off and all this kind of stuff. There was all kinds of weird stuff in the news. So our department of revenue had went into a couple different convenience stores and they had bought what said not for human consumption. They tried to say that it was the incense, but it happened to be what we called synthetic cannabinoids or the spice samples that was all over the news at the time. And granted, this has probably been 2015, maybe uh, 2014, but I had like 300 samples that came in for that case. And it took me two weeks to go through that case. So that's probably the longest that I've spent on a case for crime scene. Um, I think there was there was one case that obviously made the news back in 2011. We were there for two days, um, which is a long time, especially when you leave the house at like midnight and you have to drive three hours to get to the crime scene. And then you're up waiting for the search warrant. Then once you the, get the search warrant, you're processing. So by the time you get back to the hotel, it's super late. Then you got to go back the next day to try to finish up. And then you got to drive the three hours back to wherever your location is. 
Um, so crime scene was the two days that I had to do. Um, that was almost, I think we were up the first day, like 16 or 17 hours, but there's been some times that they are up way longer than that. So it just kind of depends. Um, how often do I deal with fentanyl? <laughs> Sometimes daily. So if I am in the lab, I'm at least usually one of my cases is now fentanyl. Um, I try to like group them. So a lot of our fentanyl cases, as I stated earlier, are the tablets. So if I see that I have some cases in my like queue that I batch that I grabbed that day, um, I'll try to pull out those tablets because they have a different extraction. So I'll try to pull all those out so that I can do them all and do the extractions all at the same time. Um, sometimes if I'm not if I'm not able to make it into the lab, then obviously I might not see anything that day. But usually nowadays, if I'm pulling cases, I have at least one fentanyl case that I am seeing. Who was the youngest person convicted that you were a part of? Um, so it was an 11 year old. Uh, it was a homicide case and he was tried as a juvie. And it was one of the ones that I did as a crime scene. Um, and we had to all go through like a whole bunch of meetings because it was obviously kind of a big deal. It didn't make the national news. So we had to all talk about kind of what we saw, what our crime scene reports were, go over them all. And uh, so, yeah, he was 11. That was the youngest person that I've dealt with. Um, but I do see a lot of young kids come in on my drug cases. Um, yeah, unfortunately. Not as young as that, but sometimes I do. Sometimes they're ODs. Um, we had one case come in where a two-year-old had gotten a hold of their parents' stash um, and they overdosed. And so they wanted to find out if, and it was pos it was actually a fentanyl pill. They were able to pull it from his mouth. He did not make it. He did pass away. Um, and we had to test the pill and we did find fentanyl. So I guess that would probably be the youngest um, that I've dealt with, I guess, on a case but it wasn't necessarily one that I processed. I just did the drugs. Like I didn't do the crime scene. I had just analyzed the pill. What is the hardest part of your job? Um, probably, there's a couple different things. Um, one of them is the backstories. So obviously sometimes those stick with you. Obviously now as a parent, some of those like the two-year-old, those kind of stick for a while. Um, the other thing is we're really short staffed. <laughs> um, Crime has not stopped while, even while COVID was happening, um, it just kind of got backed up. So with the court system and everything kind of now slowly trying to get back on track, um, we're all just a little overwhelmed because we don't have enough people we're trying to hire. We are hiring right now like crazy, um, but it's kind of hard to find people. So because you have to pass a background, so that means smoking marijuana, even though marijuana is legal in the state of Colorado, we are a drug-free workplace. So you are not allowed. Um, you also have to pass a polygraph. So anything in your past is going to come up on that polygraph. You also have to pass a psych eval, which I will admit, after I was done with that, I thought I was crazy. And they told me, oh, no, you passed. I was like, well, that's kind of scary. <laughs> but um, there's a lot of steps to getting this. So they also look at your social media um, because social media has become such a big part of everyday lives. I will tell you that employers are no, now looking at your social media. So be very, very careful what you post because once it's out there, it's out there. Um, but also if you have any desire to do any type of law enforcement, be very careful about the decisions you make. Because like I stated, and you have to go through a drug test. So if you are smoking marijuana, even though it is legal in the state, that will bump you from the process. You will not be able to get a job. Um, so right now, because we are having a hard time filling some of those positions, it's a little stressful because there's not enough of us in the lab to do all the cases that we have. So that's been a little bit stressful. What is the largest amount of a controlled substance that you have had to work with? In one item was probably the trash can of marijuana. Um, we had a bust by one of our drug task force come up and at least weight wise. And 
it literally was in a trash can, like the trash cans you set on the side of the road. So we're talking, what are those 60 gallons or something? I mean, it was the big, eventually I had to weigh the trash can and we just did a gross weight because I didn't have anything that I could dump the, the plant material in. I had enough, like we didn't have a bucket big enough for this trash can. So they just had me stick my, like the whole entire trash can on our balance. And I was able, luckily it was low enough to where it was able to be weighed, but it was quite the feat. It was pretty funny because it was almost to the ceiling because it's up on one of our benches. So yes, that's probably the biggest, but in the like scheme of amount, um, I had a really, really large fentanyl pill bust. I believe it was, if I remember correctly, about 60,000 tablets. So that was a lot. Um, obviously, I did not test all of them, but they did all come in because they were all packaged together. So if you can imagine 60,000 tablets and I mean, that's, yeah, that was a lot. But luckily, I did not have to count every single one. Um, we do a calculated count. So I took the total weight and then I took the weight of one and I divided it. So that way I kind of knew, but it was roughly over 60,000 tablets. Um, do the TV shows like NCIS and others oversimplify the job or do they keep it pretty on point with the task performs? Okay, it is nothing like that. <laughs> um, we cannot get a result that fast. Um, also, most of us don't like go out to the crime scene and then come right back in and run the sample. Um, also, usually a DNA sample doesn't get done in 10 minutes. Um, obviously, I, like, I loved CSI. Like that was one of my favorite shows and I work in it. A lot of people don't like it because it does not obviously depict a true day in the work. Um, sometimes it makes it a lot harder for our job when we go to testify in front of a jury because they call it the CSI effect. Because jurors expect you to be able to find DNA on everything, to find latent prints on everything, because that's how the TV says it works. Like every time they're in a scene, it's like, oh, we found a fingerprint or we found their DNA. And we're saying we didn't find any of that or we didn't even analyze that. Like we didn't analyze it for DNA and we didn't analyze it for fingerprints. So it's kind of a catch 22. It's great just to kind of get people interested in the field and to kind of understand a little bit about what we do. But in the grand scheme of thing, it's not great um, because it has different expectations than are what are real in real life. So, I mean, it is a true thing. There are people on the juries that will be like, well, why didn't you do DNA? Because in the state of Colorado, depending on the judge, the jury can ask you questions. So sometimes I will be asked questions by the jury um, and by the judge. So it's not just a prosecution and defense asking me questions. Sometimes it's multiple people. So that CSI effect can sometimes play a pretty big role and what their expectations are and what I actually can present in the case and what I was able to identify. So it usually doesn't affect chemistry as much as it does like biology. So your DNA and fingerprints, because obviously there's times they don't get anything or it's not a good enough to actually identify or call it to somebody. So that CSI effect does play a role a lot of times with us for court purposes. Do you get any formal training on presenting evidence in the courtroom? So we do require, one, you have to go and watch. So anytime one of the analysts, whether it's in the discipline that you're training in or a different one, we have you go. So as many times as you can go and watch somebody testify, we have you go with them. But we also do send you to a training on courtroom testimony. But the problem of it is, is you can take all the courses you want until you actually do it it's just not going to be the same because you never know what's going to happen and you never know what's going to be asked. The biggest thing for me and what I can, like, I feel like you should say to anyone is if you don't know the answer or you forget the answer, because I mean, I've had that happen where all of a sudden, like you're talking and you're like, Hey, I know that, but why can't I not remember? You have to be comfortable on the stand to say, you know what? I don't remember that. Or I don't know that off the top of my head. You have to be able to say, I don't know. And some people don't like being able to say, I don't know. So sometimes it trips them up and it makes court very uncomfortable, but court should not be uncomfortable. You just need to be able to speak and be okay with what you're doing. 
That's the biggest thing is you have to be comfortable in your analysis and confident in your analysis and that, hey, I did everything I was supposed to. This is what it is. But if you ask me some obscure question, I might not know what it is. Like, or if they ask you something that's outside your scope. So I might be asked sometimes because a lot of people think toxicology and chemistry are the same and they're really not. I might be asked, well, how does methamphetamine affect your body? That's out of my scope of expertise. So I will state that's, you'll need a toxicologist to answer that question. I cannot answer that question. And you just have to leave it at that. You can't, you can, you can never go outside of the scope that you are qualified for. You have to stick within your scope. So sometimes that gets people in trouble. But yes, we do provide training. And then, like I said, just doing it. I think now over my 16 years, I've probably testified 150 times. So I usually testify almost once a month. So does anybody else have any other questions? I know there's been a bunch going through the chats. If you guys think of anything or if you guys want to unmute yourself, I guess you're allowed to, I think. But does anybody else have any questions? You've got about seven more minutes left. What is the most enjoyable part of your job? Um, honestly, just doing the cases. Like I really like going into the lab. I like being able to just sit down at my bench and do my cases. Like, cause to me, it, like I said, it's part of a puzzle. Like I'm trying, they've asked me to figure out what this substance is. And so I'm trying to figure that out. So for me, just getting able to spend the day in the lab, not having to do reviews, not having to go to court, just doing pretty much going back to basics. I like just being able to sit in the lab and do my analysis. Do you have certain symbols to clean up certain symptoms? So they asked if I had certain chemicals that I use to clean up certain substances. So it kind of depends on what I'm going to get with my color test, because that's usually what I use for my presumptives. Some substances don't work in just regular like methanol, or they have some fillers. So like the fentanyl tablets, usually they have some what we call acetaminophen, which is Tylenol. That will blow up my column. So that'll be this massive, massive peak. And I won't really see the fentanyl very well. So I'll actually do what's called a basic extraction. So I will actually put base, like a basic solution on that powder or that tablet that I've crushed up. And I'm gonna pull that acetaminophen and then I'm gonna throw in chloroform. Well, that basic solution is gonna hold that acetaminophen and most of it will stay in that basic solution. And then the fentanyl and maybe a little bit of the acetaminophen is gonna go into the chloroform. And then I'm going to pull that chloroform off and that's what I'm going to run. So I, that basic solution will then hold most of that acetaminophen. So now when I look at my data, I'm seeing mostly the fentanyl and not the big acetaminophen because I don't care about the acetaminophen. I just care about the fentanyl peak. It's the same sometimes with meth. Um, sometimes they're, it's mixed with what we call dimethyl sulfone. So we might put again a basic solution in there and then pull it up in hexane. And it's the same thing that dimethyl sulfone will stay mostly in that basic solution. A little bit still will go through, but most of it will stay in that basic solution. And then when I pull the hexane, I'm gonna get a really, really pretty peak of the methamphetamine. How many times have you had someone at a crime scene mess with something or ruin your results? So I've only actually had one time that I've had a suspect slash victim come into the crime scene. Um, Otherwise, the crime scenes are pretty secure, so we don't usually have to worry about, you know, making sure that nobody, but I, I did have one. It was a smaller town. Um, I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden we were processing the shooting scene and the guy walked into the house. So it was a little nerve wracking. Um, obviously, we had to get him back out of the house. Um, he was told he was not allowed back in the house, but that's been the only time that I've ever had that happen is just the one time. What should students in middle school and high school do to prepare for a career in science? So I would say pretty much any time that you can go to, sometimes labs will do tours. Um, any time, like, like I said, hard science. Go and get a degree in a hard science. So whether that's bio, whether that's chemistry, you know, I, I think we even have some mathematic people there. Um, some of our latent prints, I think we have two latent print examiners now that actually have a degree in math. 
Um, but I mean, it's still, you know, still a hard degree, I guess, is what they're saying. Um, but that would be my biggest thing. Also, maybe do some ride alongs. Sometimes those are fun and it gives you some perspective from a different standpoint because obviously they might be submitting those drugs to the lab. Um, but the biggest thing I can say is go and get a degree in a hard science. Make sure you have that four-year degree. You don't have to have a master's, you don't have to have a PhD, but you do have to have at least a BA. So yeah, I have a BS, but you have to have at least a BA in there to make sure. So keep going to your science. Obviously, I know you guys can take science classes and upper math, upper math classes in high school. So I would do those if you can. It's one less thing you have to do in college, um, but you're gonna have to study, unfortunately. Like this is not, I mean, my degree is pretty much chemistry. So I had to do a lot of chemistry and a lot of math, statistics, physics, all of that kind of stuff. Um, the one class I think I hated the most was organic. I still hate that stuff. Um, but unfortunately you have to do a whole year of it with the labs. So it's just, it's not going to be easy. I will tell you, it's a lot of hard work. Like I was definitely the nerd that spent a ton of time studying at the library. I was definitely that kid. I'm the nerd, but you're going to have to study for this in order to kind of, this is definitely what you're kind of looking at. Um, what are the safety precautions taken when in the lab? So every time we're in the lab, we always have gloves on and we always have a lab coat. Um, if we're dealing with any type of what we call bulk powders, so like the kilos or anything like that, um, we usually do those under the hood. Um, if it's just like the normal meth, we have what we call an N95 mask that does have a filter on it. So we'll just put that on. We do have a respirator because sometimes we can't get the comp, like the actual item under the hood. So if we have to open it up outside the hood, we have an actual respirator. So it's like, you know, the guys that you see in the suits, but ours is just over our face. Um, we always have Narcan in case something happens. Um, also in chemistry, I have a panic button. So if I am by myself in the lab, I have it by my station so that if something happens, I start feeling weird, I actually hit that. And the alarm goes off, it automatically goes to the fire department and the EMS, but it also goes to the lab and on all the alarm panels, it says chemist down. <laughs> so they know to come running um, to see what's going on. So obviously there's usually two of us in the lab at a time, but on the off chance there's not, I do have that panic button um, and I keep that with me when I'm by myself. Um, what happens if something goes wrong with a test and a mistake was made? What do you do? So we have what we have a quality system. So if a mistake is made and we find it and then we can rectify it, we will actually start documenting that. So we'll do what we call a quality incident review. We figure out where the mistake was made, how it was made, how we can fix it in the past. If it's a wrong result, a new report will go out. And then that way, and I mean, we don't hide anything. That's part, that's kind of the thing. You have to be complete completely open, that's part of our accreditation. So we have that whole quality system in place to make sure that if any mistakes are made, or if we happen to make a mistake and not follow one of our procedures, doesn't necessarily mean that we made a mistake on the results, but if we happen to violate a procedure, that is still documented. So even if the results are the same and the results are fine, if something happened in the process of doing them, that is still documented. So that it's what we call a quality incident review. So all of that gets examined because they have to review that actually every year for our accreditation. So is any other questions? I know we're right at noon. So I saw a couple, but that's the last one in the chat. Does anybody else have any other ones? Looks like we're good. I wanted to take a moment and thank all of the teachers, the schools, the students um, for attending with us today and for having such great questions. And Natasha, we're super grateful for your time. Thank you so much for, for taking this time and sharing with us such an informative and wonderful presentation on your profession. It was fabulous. Thank you.